I explore different platforms, but everyone seems to be exactly the same. Some of them might have like a different sidebar that tells you different stats or like a better Shopify integration, but really all the same. Zowie popped up one day for me. What really sold me on them was they're willing to work with their partners. I really like their business model, where instead of it's basing it on the number of seats, it's based on the number of automations they do for you. I was bringing up ideas, and they were like, "Yeah, we can do this for you. We, like, we can build this for you. We can build this automation." I'm like, "Okay, yeah, it sounds very intriguing." And it actually kept up to the promises. Everything we proposed, they've been building for us, and then it's really like we're building our own platform for CX. Welcome to the D 2 C podcast, Mike. This is. I've been, you know, following Monos for a long time. We've had Roxanne Tan. I've done a couple couple talks with Roxanne Tan. Oh, no way. Yeah, so it's really cool to have you on the podcast here. Why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your history and your role specifically at Monos? Yeah, definitely. Well, I work in the e-com department and the customer experience. So my background has always been customer experience. I came from a hotel background. Um, and then I joined Monos in 2021. That time had about 20 people. So really built the customer service team and Pretty much the entire company, if you look at it right now, from the not the ground up because I joined two years after, but uh, just built the whole the current team that time. I joined right after we got our uh, Series A investment, and then after that, we just basically took off. We grew about five hundred percent in twenty twenty two, thirty percent last year compared to twenty twenty two, and then yeah, looking for around the same growth. Obviously, it's like we're not expecting. 500% every year, but definitely a good, healthy, sustainable growth. So that 2022 is the rebound, I guess, after COVID a little bit exactly. where people were just starting to travel like crazy. And that hasn't really slowed down. You, you kind of capitalize that and are leveraging that into today's times. Exactly. So when you started in 2021, what did your CX tech stack look like? Yeah, so we were on Freshdesk. It was very manual. You know, it was um, that time I actually joined right before Black Friday or around Black Friday, we were probably 2,000 tickets overdue. Uh, that time, the entire company got in, uh, you know, the CEO, the founders, the marketing team, creative team all got in to help tackle tickets. And it was really like just doing our best to like maintain and then see, see, if, see if it like comes down. You know, we were, uh, we also had supply chain products that time. You know, remember that time it was like we had like a huge winter storm in the west coast of Vancouver. Uh, you know, the shipments were delayed. Customers were waiting for like a month, two months for the products, right? And then it's also like that crunch time right before Christmas time as well. It was very, I would say, like a very manual process. We we're doing returns manually as well. So our return, uh, customer requested return, we would have to make each label manually. That took about twenty minutes. And then since then, we've just been automating, uh, revamping, it's been more efficient. Yeah, we'll get into that. I will, I want to just talk about your category, like luggage as a category. It's it's a high AOV, high cost, probably high consideration cycle as well with the product. So is there like, I don't know if you've worked in other uh, categories of, of, you know, apparel, things like that, but is, is luggage considered like a high touch customer experience versus other brands? Yeah, totally. I would say it is, you know, you know, customers do want to feel in touch with the luggage. You know, we've noticed even as well, once we open up the retail store, customers are we're getting different feedback from customers. Like we're customers are seeing different details on our products that we've never had the conversations before with them about. Uh, like things like our premium hybrid collection. Uh, we actually, when they enter in, in the store to see the products in person, they actually like it even better. You know, as you know, when we were just online, we we're thinking that oh, they you know people never really go for it because it's maybe too expensive. Maybe it's like a higher price point. You know, they want an entry level product, but actually seeing in person, customers are like willing to pay the higher price. So yeah, it is that like challenge of uh, how to get the customers to fully understand what the product really is, how to really allow them to imagine what it's like to have it in your hands online with uh, just the limited tools that you can offer. But yeah, but that's why you know we're creating our retail stores and launching them to Super do that. Cool. And, uh, touch experience luggage really is like a status you know when you're in the airport you're you're with among a bunch of other travelers there's this there's like that status aspect and i guess monos has a slightly different form factor or like you can tell a mono suitcase suitcase from the 50 years of suitcases that kind of came before it from its visual factor right definitely uh yeah we definitely want to uh as a business be accessible to everybody you know we want to be sustainable as well you know i think you do have like those status brands like Ramoa, right that's you know out there. People see over months. I go, okay, yeah, I know it's like a thousand dollars, but um, yeah, it's interesting to me because comparing on the customer service side, 
uh, NPS scores. It's basically like how I see it is um, how customers feel, like how much a customer feels attached to the brand. And I know like Ramola just from studying their NPS score is quite low, even though people love the products, right? But it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of understandable because the NPS low is low because you're just using that product to travel when you travel, right? For us, we actually see a higher NPS score, even though it's like the same category, because uh, I believe the lower price point, and also people just feel more attached to the brand. Maybe for our different campaigns, different storytelling, our customer service, our sort of white glove service that we provide. Yeah, we see our NPS score about like 66. And I know Ramoa, you know, not to like, like stop bashing them because it's nothing negative, but it's just sort of how people perceive the brand. It's, it's uh, maybe I think it's like 10 to 20 um, wow. from my studies. And it shows you, yeah, just that that customer experience is that 360 degree experience, even aside from the product. Talk about when uh, those early days when you came in, when you were, I think you said a, a, a thousand tickets or so behind. Uh, talk about your process about getting the, you know, putting your stamp on the organization and kind of getting things the way you want it. Yeah. So at that time we had uh, around six people in our customer service team, all based in Vancouver. So I really felt that we needed uh, external support. So we're looking at offshore teams. Uh, you know, at that time, it was very difficult to hire in Vancouver. You know, I had to find the right person, especially during like Christmas time, right? You know, nobody really looking for a job at that time. And that time, you know, from my calculations, probably needed about like maybe like 20 people right away in order to keep up with the volume. Uh, so we, yeah, we went out looking uh, for offshore um, options. So we actually right now do have a team based in the Philippines. Uh, we have about 40 people. And then the difference is, you know, when I was looking for different partners in the Philippines, uh, the only thing I asked for is I wanted direct access to the employees. So in house companies like Telus and Rogers, uh, they have, do have offshore, right? They can tell, but they're only, that person is only dedicated to one specific task. Let's say like returns, retention. You know, if you like need to like dispute something, oh, let me connect you to someone else that handles disputes, right? But um, I wanted to build a team where everyone feels empowered. So our team uh, right now, has no escalation process. If there's an issue, you have an issue with our products, the agent can make the decision. They can give a refund, they can ship a replacement, they can do whatever they want, or whatever they feel is right. You mentioned the white glove, this idea of, of white glove customer experience. Was that was that something that existed in the organization or was that something you kind of brought to it to make sure that you really, the customers were really the focus? Yeah, I would say that's something that we like aspire to, right? Um, but we never had sort of the foundation. We were always like, putting out fires, right? We never could really sort of build that experience. But yeah, you know, that time we but going back, you know, we found that partner, found the right partner. So we hire everybody at the same time, hire about 40 people at the same time. I interviewed each one. Basically I like, brought them in, no managers, no supervisors, but just like a flat organization chart and team. Everyone's like asking me questions, you know, and then you know I want to be hands on as well, right? Because I want to be able to like coach and mentor them at the same time. And then yeah, soon enough after a few months things started rolling, getting more automated. They started learning, they uh, started getting more comfortable. And then uh, it just, we really just took off. We were able to like get ahead. Uh, you know, I, I, like I remember we were celebrating when we hit zero tickets in the inbox one day. And then right now, you know, those teams that to develop into, uh, you know, one of them actually is training our retail staff. So because we want to offer a full omni-channel experience, we have a team member in the Philippines training our retail staff because we want them to see what, we we'll want the retail team member to see what it feels like to work online and translate that into the store because we're on Shopify, right? Uh, Shopify POS. So it's like, if you work online, you can enter the store and start working right away. It's the same process. It's just on the iPad. So it's kind of like the analogy I like to use is like walking into a real life video game that you've been playing for a few months. Really cool. Um, do you, are you using anything? And I, well, I, I really want to get into AI. I think I think customer service and AI are this are you know it's the area that's going to be most impacted the soonest. But I'm curious when it comes to products like yours that have such a great form factor, are you doing different things with uh, I don't know augmented reality or different ways of showing the product on your Shopify site using any tech for that? No, we haven't explored any of that. It's just about imagery creatives for us being on brand and like storytelling. Uh, that is working for us right now, but, uh, but yeah, on the AI portion, as you know, you know, we're on Zowie right now. So that's really been really interesting for us, actually, just being able to uh, train, develop an AI just for us. Um, yeah, but I can talk more. 
Yeah, walk me through that process of, of sort of what led you because I think I think we've we've known that uh, in you know CX AI is going to have the most direct implications first, along with creative and some other areas. But talk about your process, like looking for for a tool like that, why you were looking for it, and why you kind of came to Zowie. Yeah, um, so you know I explored different platforms, uh, but everyone seems to be exactly the same, right? Everyone has like some of them might have like a different sidebar that tells you different stats or like gives you like a Shopify, a better, a better Shopify integration, but really, if you look down at the core, it's really all the same. And then Zowie popped up uh, one day for me on LinkedIn. I never heard of it before. And then really just, I think it was like AI or like automated uh, responses. I'm like, yeah, okay, this probably is like one, one of, like another one of the same company. So I set up a call and then what really sold me on them was they're willing to work with their partners. I really like their business model where instead of it's basically it on the number of seats, it's based on the number of automations they do for you. So this way, you know, thinking uh, like my thought process was, okay, as we're growing, you know, retail staff needs to be on this platform as well. As we're going, it's like, yeah, it can actually save us costs because we're not counting number of seats. We're counting number of fraud conversations, basically. And then, you know, going through them and then I was bringing up ideas and then they were like, yeah, we can do this for you. We can do it, like, we can build this for you. We can build this automation. I'm like, okay, yeah, sounds like, sounds very intriguing. And it actually kept up to the promises. Like everything we proposed, um, they've been building for us. And then it's really like we're building our own platform for CX. And then the way that I think that the way how we shifted our workflow is that, you know, with other platforms, it's kind of like, okay, you have agents. And then um, we have like a bucket of tickets. Everyone goes in, takes a ticket and knocks them down. But with Zowie, I see it as, you know, you're setting up different sort of places within your team and then you're finding the most efficient way to have the tickets flow for your team. So maybe like, you know, it's like kind of like opening up a dam, make sure all the pieces are set. And then once you put them down, the tickets just flood through and then you're finding the most efficient way to to um, automate all those tickets and knock them down. Uh, you know, yes. I was just going to say, in this way, do you are you find more efficiency where you're able to route certain tasks to specialized team members or specialize in returns or specialize like what 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 are some examples of efficiencies you gain by that? Yeah, I mean, so so warranty claims, for example, if before customers had to file warranty claim to submit pictures, and then because we need to back it up, uh, the warranty team basically opens up the the claim, has to copy and paste the pictures into uh, Google Drive, and save it for backup, and back to the customer. But basically, like, Zowie automated for us where uh, once a claim is filed, the picture is automatically installed for Google Drive, and then the ticket is presented right in front of the agent. So that probably saves about, like, five to ten minutes. I'm not, like, it's small, but if you add them up uh, over the year, it is, like, uh, many hours. Uh, price adjustments as well, something that we're working on right now. Uh, when a customer comes in on the sidebar, Zowie is able to tell us what the price of that item in the order is right now and what's the price difference so the agent doesn't have to calculate it manually. Just oh, like nice. that automation, just those like little things. Uh, yeah, it's like just super exciting that they built that for us. And that adds up in organizationally in terms of hours for your team, but it also the responsiveness adds to the customer experience as well, right? Because your customers are getting their results faster. Yeah, totally. And then like, that's the way like I see things and manage as well. Like I'm looking, I'm not looking for the big project or like a big platform that can save us which is how we can cut down all those little steps because in the end, they do add up to the big success, right? Because they all add up together. And that's why having a platform that can help you rather than just taking a big platform and you trying to figure out all your workflows to, to make it work for you, having a platform that has something strong and that allows you to customize w- with mm-hmm. them is probably super beneficial. Exactly. Uh, so what does your team look like with, like, I think one of the worries with, uh, or one of the thoughts with CX is that, uh, and AI is that when you have these AI sim- systems implemented, you can spend less on headcount on your actual team. Is is that something you found? I would say, look at it from the other direction. You, your team can do, can engage in more meaningful conversations with the customers. Uh, so we shifted it, it a bit. We have, I have a few team members, a small group. Just their sole job is just to manage the AI salary. So all they do is looking at the AI conversations, correcting it, teaching it, training it. You know, the AI is kind of like, I would say, it, like it's fun. The AI is kind of like a new staff that joins. And then I think it's like that effect where I think it's too flustered and it doesn't know an answer. It just spits all a random answer that may be completely incorrect, but it's also funny at the same time, right? It's like telling customers that, oh, uh, 
like promising customers sometimes that I will give you a full replacement or like a full refund, something like that. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that, oh, that was my next question is like, what are some of the growing pains or what are some of the challenges that you faced, uh, you know, using an AI platform? Yeah, I would say you just need to be patient in the beginning, right? You, you're, you're expecting it to work right away, but it's not going to work right away. You have to train it, knowledge. You have to make sure that, you know, keep on it, do the small tweaks, build automations as well. But, uh, but yeah, it actually does get smarter. I actually have no idea how it works sometimes. Sometimes it just pulls, able to like pull information, like customers asking, like, for example, uh, are your materials uh, on Prop 65 in California, right? And they ask like, oh, uh, no, that, that's not applicable to us because our products, we specifically chose materials that are not on the list. So we actually don't require a label. And then the customer's like, oh, thank you so much. Like, I'm going to buy something right now. Nice. <laughs> and that was correct in this case. That's good. That was correct, yes. <laughs> that's yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that's that's super interesting. And then what does training the AI for CX like look like? Does it is it is it your your SOPs that you're uploading or like what does training actually look like? Yeah, so there are a few points. So you'll be able to upload like uh, frequently asked questions and that builds this knowledge base. You also be able to link it to different uh, web pages as well for it to get knowledge there. So, for example, your product pages, your collection pages, your about page on your website. <clears throat> it's able to pull every information and uh, paraphrase it in its own words. And then we have this training tool where basically it uh, lists all the conversation, all the sentences the AI is responding to. <clears throat> it actually shows the thought process of the AI. So it's like, I see this in my knowledge base, but I don't know which one it is. Um, I have option one, I have option two. And then you can uh, choose it that, okay, go with this experience or modify or add a new experience. And this way it learns for the next time. Uh, you can even tell it to like, say it different, like say it more professionally. Like we were, like the AI, like the last week was saying something like, um, oh, like here's the way to do a refund. Easy peasy, right? Like 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 saying that to a customer and then we yeah. just told it like not to say that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's funny. With your AI agents, do people know they're interacting with AI or are they, is it passing for human? We made it, uh, we put in slight hints to let the customer know that it is AI because we want to make sure that, you know, they understand that and they understand that, oh, they do want to talk to human. Uh, we are available. So the opening message is like, oh, I'm, I'm a self-serve assistant. You have to assist you, ask me any questions. And then, you know how most AIs, if you ask a question it doesn't understand, most AIs will say, like, um, I don't understand, try again. I don't understand, try again. So what we did was, we, if that happens, we put a message, oh, let me find a team member to better assist with this question. So it transferred to the agent right away. This way it feels seamless and the customers aren't like stuck there, like trying to ask or like trying to ask the right prompt. Very cool. And then what metrics or, or KPIs do you have after, so how long have you been on Zowie? And then what do your metrics or KPIs that look like? Two months. So it's pretty early. Two months. Yeah. So uh, right now we're simply looking at our... On the agent side, you know, same thing like uh, resolution time, response time, number of waiting tickets. On the AI side, we're looking at deflection rates. So basically how many conversations are resolved by the AI. We're seeing about 20% right now, 20 to 25. So that's like, yeah, it's like 200 chats for us in a day. That is a lot, right? Yeah, and just in, <laughs> just in your first two months too, it's sort of impressive. Like how, how what, what are your goals with deflection? Yeah, um, it's kind of interesting, right? Because <clears throat> if you... Yeah, you can aim for sixty percent, but it's like from a brand from a brand experience, would you lose that personal human touch? Maybe maybe you can get it, right? But maybe it can't, but maybe it's like maybe it's like the optimal point is like thirty, forty percent where it still balance out the human experience part, right? So but but that's something I'm uh, evaluating. And then as you said earlier, that frees up your your humans to do more human delightful things. Can you can you give me an example of ways that you've made more time for like real human interaction by getting your twenty five percent deflection rate? Yeah. I mean so right now we're you know, most of our deflections are uh how do I return our product, how do I exchange? You know, we're doing this like promo on site for like a free gift if you maybe make a purchase. It's like customers are like having trouble understanding like like how that works. So the AI takes care of that. <clears throat> so pretty much like all the tickets we're getting right now are just customers that actually need help. Customers that actually um, already filed a warranty claim already because the AI directed them to the right place, right? We're getting to sort of the heart of the conversation 
not just like the beginning process where we're like, like trying to get them to uh, or like help them to get to the right spots where like they're already in the right spots already for us to have meaningful conversations. And then some of the AI tools that I've seen, and I, I could be wrong about Zowie. I don't know if Zowie does this, but I'll, I'll, it sounds like we're talking about everything that happens like post-purchase or with a ticket. But when it comes to people on your, I think one of the other categories of AI tools is is when people are on your website, maybe browsing around and then they they show exit intent or they show specific things. And then the AI, more like a sales concierge kind of goes to them proactively and tries to bring them into a sale. Is that something you do with Zowie? Uh, we're going to start that next week, actually. So we're gonna yeah we're gonna do a proactive chat next week. So like things like you know if they're on the collection page, product page, for a few seconds, we'll pop up say hey would you like a comparison with another brand like Away or Moa? If they're on a cart page, oh can I help you uh, recommend some upsells? Uh, something like that. We're planning to build a small sales team to help with those conversations, but the AI can help with that as well. You know, and then it's cool because we're able to track how much revenue generated from those conversations so i think the tracking is like if we or the ai has a conversation with the customer and they convert 48 hours or within 40 hours then that's attributed to the last person they spoke to nice so like so yeah you can like uh, gamify it cx dream to become a profit center yes that's the goal nice that sounds awesome what are there anything else that you're planning with uh with either zowie or with other ai tools on your uh, on your cx team you know i've been speaking to this uh returns uh vendor a competitor of loop Okay, and then they they they're telling us that they develop like an AI tool <clears throat> because you know the thing with returns, right? If you don't take use returns, which we don't, because it creates more waste for us. You know, it's like how do you stop that, right? Sometimes people will like ship rocks. Sometimes people will ship uh, used luggage. So it's like that's something we're exploring right now. And then that the AI part of it, it's like you tell customers to upload certain parts of the luggage, so like the wheels, the handles. And then the AI can pick out if the wheels are used because if the wheels are used, it's pretty difficult to have it cleaned, right? It's because because it's a rubber, it's like all the dirt uh, sticks to it. So the AI can pick that part out and uh, basically tell the customer, well, this is used, so the return is denied. Here are your options. So that's something we're exploring. And then, nice. uh, yeah, that should help us. Very cool. Uh, so if you're listening to this and you are one of the many D2C founders or team leads that wants to start automating more of your CX, you should go to getzowie.com. Um, you, you just, I, th- I think you you spoke to earlier the fact that uh, the team is really responsive and reflexive to your needs. Like how how quickly, like who, who was your contact point at Zowie? Like, were you talking to someone close to the founder? Were you talking to the, like, how does it work once you're a Zowie client when it comes to these sort of custom integrations? Yeah, I'm actually in contact with one of the founders, uh, Matrix. He is nice. the CTO and also the co-founder. Yeah, he's uh, he's like a workhorse. He's you know everything you bring up to him, he responds right away. Have him on WhatsApp as well. It's like um, stuff is wrong with the AI or like how do we set this up or like uh, our team member, for example. Oh yeah, this is a good, like this is a pretty cool one because our team members is some of them are in the Philippines, right? And then because they're seeing uh, middle, uh, Philippines time on Zawi, so all the stats are different for them. So we want to be able to see the same stats. So basically, Zowie reconstructed the entire platform to show us to show the time in PST for us. And then uh, Maycheck was like, "Yeah, don't worry. Like, we're gonna stun. We're gonna stun." And like everything I tell them, he's like, "Oh, we're gonna stun." They pretty much like kept up with all the promises. It's been really cool and really uh, supportive. Very and, nice. And no, and no extra cost as well. That's wild. And you say, and so just so give me, I, I understand the seats for agents aspect. Like the, the, in a lot of platforms, you're paying for the seats, you're paying for the number of agents you have. And in this case, you're paying for the number of automation. So that's like, that's like your return automation. That's like all these different functions of your business. You're just paying for those. And then do you pay for volume of those things within those automations? Uh, no, it's simply just based on the number of automations. So Zowie, their whole incentive is to um, automate for you. So that's why they want to build for you as well, right? That's why they want to, that, that, that's why we're still willing to build. Because if you they do build it for you, then your automation counts go up. And that's how uh, you get built. Yeah, which makes perfect sense. I, I did a podcast a few months ago with, it was a SaaS podcast that I did with Yachtpo and Sean Frank. And we were ended, we were talking, actually, no, this was another, I sometimes get podcasts mixed up. This was another one I was talking with an AI developer that was saying that SaaS, when it went from the, cl- you know, when it went from on-premise SaaS, which it was like in the Mad Men era, up to like the cloud SaaS, that big revolution. And now we're headed to an AI tool revolution where this concept of having seats for humans is really outdated because you actually just need to put your input 
input and get an output, which is kind of, it sounds like the way Zowie's doing it. So it sounds like they're on the, on the cutting edge of, of the way SaaS platforms are going in this AI age, which is cool. Totally. And, and it makes sense as well, right? You know, in turn, your customers feel like they get better customer service from you because you're actually like helping them build, right? Whereas like most SaaS platforms, they count seats. So they're making the money that way. So they don't really care like what else they do for you, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's like, it is outdated. Yeah. The incentives aren't aligned too, right? Because just by adding another seat, you're adding another cost to your business. You're going to get maybe more efficiency because you're going to get more more tickets done or whatever. But yeah, the you can see how the incentives aren't sort of perfectly aligned in that situation. You could end up feeling when you're running a big organization that you're getting gouged a little bit potentially if it's by that seat number or whatever, right? Oh. Is there any aspect of that? You mentioned this new thing that you're going to be integrating with the, um, you know, the pre-click sales team or whatever. Is there any aspect of rev share that's built into that where they take credit for any of the revenue that's generated? Uh, we're still exploring that. But yeah, that definitely could be fun because that could be a fun incentive to make it uh, competitive. Very cool. Nice, man. Well, great to meet you. Thanks for coming on today. I'll, I'll, I think I told you in our last one, but remind you that we've got our mastermind coming up September 18th to 19th. We'd love to have you out for that in Victoria. But yeah, man, great to meet you. This was this was really cool. And remember, go to getzowie.com. Check it out if you're looking for AI. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at directtoconsumer, all one word, dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.